good afternoon. Um, it's my second time here, and I'm delighted to be here. Good afternoon. Mm. So um, Sandra mentioned about um, um, mental illness and physical well-being. Um, I would like to mention that lifestyle diseases also um, has a component on me mental, mental illness has a component in lifestyle diseases, only that we won't be tackling that today. We'll be talking about more physical, meaning your, you know, your organs. Um, so I, I, I am a lecturer as well. So I go around asking people questions. I hope you'll bear with me. It's something that is, you know, as a lecturer, you just ask things. So let me hear, what do you think lifestyle diseases are? Like, what are they? Um, OK, what I know about lifestyle diseases are uh, those things that uh, we experience on our daily lives according to how we live, what we eat, those are, are things that cause how we live. Or my well-being depends, depends upon what I eat. Yes. Perfect. I think she's just mentioned it all. So uh, depending on how we live, our day-to-day -day activities that eventually affect the diseases that then come up in our bodies, so I'll start by talking about hypertension. And hypertension is basically the pressure within your blood vessels. So um, we use a cutoff of 120, 80. Uh, the upper one is what we call systolic. The, uh, the lower figure, or the figure uh, on my right, is the diastolic. So 120, 80 means a systolic of 120. A diastolic of 80. So stage 1 hypertension is when it is up to 130 to 139 as a systolic, uh, 80 to 89 as a diastolic. Stage 2 is what we can see there, 140 to 179 as a systolic, then 90 to 119 as a diastolic. If you happen to have one, more than 180 as a systolic and more than 120 as a diastolic, then you have uh, hypertensive crisis. There are people who their systolic um, pressure is normal, but their diastolic is more than 90, and those are still termed as hypertensives because the dangers that then face people with hypertension, whether it's systolic or diastolic, is the same. So um, in Kenya, every Four in 10 people have hypertension. So assuming we are, let me make it easier to understand. If we are 100 people in this um, hall, in the church, um, 40 of us have hypertension. Then of those 40%, um, only 30% are aware that they are hypertensive. So that is like 12 people. Out of the 100, only 12 know that they have hypertension. Then even a smaller figure, 6.5 are the ones who are on medication. So that gives you like a one, one person, like one person, one person only among the 100, only one person is on medication. And even a smaller figure, less than one person is well controlled. So you can imagine Probably some of us here seated don't know we have hypertension and an even smaller number is well controlled. The risk factors, I don't want us to dwell so much on the non-modifiable because we can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about our age. It is a blessing to age. We can't do anything about our gender. We can't do anything about where we come from and our family background. But we can do something about this. So that is where my talk will be concentrating on. 
Um, so those are the modifiable risks, excessive salt intake, being obese or overweight, lack of exercise, excessive alcohol consumption, and smoking. Now, besides hypertension, diabetes is the other lifestyle disease. Uh, and basically what that means is when you have chronic um, elevated blood sugar in your blood for over a longer, uh, a long period of time. Um, and it, it then if you are diabetic, then you have an, um, an abnormal way of how you're handling food. We know that every food that you eat eventually is converted to glucose. So how your body handles that food then is not the normal way if you have diabetes. Um, there are people who get diabetes because their, body, their pancreas, the organ that produces insulin, is not producing enough. But some have enough insulin production only that it is not working well. So those are the ones we call type 2 diabetes. So in Africa, those are the statistics. 24 million people have diabetes, but only half of that number are diagnosed. Then because of the poor or low level of diagnosis, then we end up having a lot of mortality. So again, I'll urge all of us to go pass by the tent, have your sugars and your uh, blood pressure checked. So the symptoms of diabetes are what we know. You've had people saying, oh, I'm taking a lot of water, I'm peeing a lot, I've lost weight. So it is all there. Excessive tiredness, tinglings of the hands and feet, um, uh, impaired vision, excessive hunger and craving for food, uh, sugary foods, slow wound healing, and for the ladies, they have recurrent vaginal infections. I don't know if that projects well, but this is one of the earliest signs that we have, uh, you're producing enough insulin, but that insulin is just not working. So at the folds, mostly at the neck and at your armpits, you get darkening. It is not normal. You can examine yourself when you go home, find out, and for that reason, then you go for further tests. Now there, I wanted to show something that I'm, I'm sure you have commonly seen. These, we call them xanthelasmas. They're just uh, cholesterol deposits under the skin. And that is a sign of high cholesterol, which goes most of the time hand in hand with diabetes. So how do we tell someone has diabetes? We either do check your sugars, like I'm, I'm sure some of you are passed by the tent, then you get a prick, and then they put it you know, on the glucometer machine. So if you did that before you took anything in the morning, we call it fasting blood sugar. If you've checked your sugars any time during the day, whether you've eaten or not, that is called random blood sugar. Now, as a way of trying to find out if indeed you are diabetic, then we go even further and uh, check your average sugars within the last three months, and that is what we call HbA1c. So the normal is if you, your HbA1c is less than 5.7, or your fasting blood sugar is less than 6.1, or your random blood sugar less than 7.8. These show that you are almost becoming diabetic and this is the window that I would like us to, to take action on because then you can do something to reverse and go back to the normal. If you are already here, there are still some steps that you can take to get better sugar control. So what are the risk factors for diabetes, overweight, and obesity? You will realize that that was also in hypertension. Uh, family history, again, it was also in hypertension, lack of physical activity, and again, that was also in hypertension. Um, gestational diabetes, uh, some people carry pregnancies and deliver, 
but they never realize that they are diabetic or they're at risk of uh, getting diabetes. If you get a baby over the weight of four kilograms, chances are in the future, studies are showing that in eight to 10 years, you might develop diabetes. Not everyone, but chances are, increased chances. So by the time you're getting a big baby, I know it's joy, and you feel very happy to get a big baby, at least you're not told to stay in hospital for baby to grow, but it is then good to be on follow-up and see if you'll get, uh, you'll get diabetes. Prolonged steroid use for whatever reason, asthma, skin conditions, you're put on steroids, and then you use them for a very long time, that can cause diabetes, and it can cause hypertension. Age, there's nothing we can do about it. But stress and inadequate sleep, that we can do a lot about. Let me just walk around and hear how people slept yesterday night. So how many hours did you sleep? I slept well. You slept well. Yes, I did, yes. How many hours? Can you remember? I think about maybe five hours. Five hours. Not enough. <laughs> you slept very well, but that wasn't enough. Around six hours. six hours. No one is sleeping ten hours or more than six. No? How long did you sleep? Eight hours. Eight hours. So you'll see as we go, uh, five hours might not be enough. I know it was quite refreshing, but that might not be enough. So for overweight and obesity, what we have seen as risk factors for both diabetes and hypertension is if you check your BMI and it is between uh, 25 to 29.9. Now, how do you check your BMI? I know I saw a weighing machine there and it has the, the thing for measuring your height. I will encourage that if you haven't passed through there, just find out. These are now important numbers that you need to know. So you take your height in meters, then you square it. That just means if you are 1.5, you'll do uh, 1.5 meters, you'll do 1.5 times 1.5. Then say you are 70 kgs. So you'll say uh, 70 divided by that 1.5 times 1.5. Am I making sense? Whatever you get, that is your BMI. If it is between 25 to 29.9, you are overweight. If it is above 30, then you are obese. But if it is below that up to 19, then you're in the green zone. If it is below 19, then again, you need to add some weight. But not only the people who are a bit on the heavier side, there's an entity called thin on the outside, fat on the inside. So it just means that you are accumulating fat inside not you your 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 genetic makeup does not allow you to add weight and become fat but you have a lot of cholesterol deposited inside um and that is an an entity um it's called toffee uh, we abbreviate it as toffee it basically just means that around your organs there's a lot of fat accumulation. How will you know that? You might need to do um, cholesterol levels to check on that uh, and still do a lot of exercise. What you can then uh, measure and give you a better um, representation of how healthy your body structure is, is checking your we, um, we call it waist circumference. People go even further to do waist and hip circumference. So if you are a lady, this is your desired weight circumference, 60 to 80 centimeters. If you are a man, up to 94. If you are up to 88 centimeters as a lady, then you need to do something. Above 102, as a man, you need to do something. 
then if above one or two, then you must do something to not get the, these lifestyle diseases. So as a common complication of both diabetes and hypertension is something that I was requested to, to talk about and up just a little bit on uh, chronic kidney disease. And that if you, you probably know someone who is undergoing dialysis or someone who is having kidney disease just hoping not to get to dialysis. Uh, the other complication is heart disease and this can be a, a wide array. It can be heart failure, it can be a heart attack, it can be a problem with the muscles, it can be muscles of the heart, basically many things. Stroke. I'm sure uh, we know someone who's had a stroke or we've heard of someone who's had a stroke. Poor eyesight. Both diabetes and hypertension do that. Not the eyesight of short-sightedness or, or seeing quite far. That is different. Um, you have a vessel problem in your eyes, so you end up having... Uh, changes within your eyes. I'm sure you, you've had people going for laser surgery, etc., etc. Um, amputations, you've seen people amputated, and sexual dysfunctions. That is erectile dysfunction, and I'm sure you can imagine how stressful it can be to a family. So these are just a, a pictogram depicting all the, the complications that we can have. Now, kidney disease, so that we get to know these signs and symptoms before we, we even get them. Um, the earliest signs are you have reduced urine output, but most often people find reasons for that. They'll say, oh, I didn't take enough water. Oh, I was busy, so I really didn't feel like going to the washroom. But it is nice to just monitor your output, plus the color of the urine. Uh, so blood in urine is an early sign. Lower limb swelling. So for the gentlemen, as you wear socks and then you wear your official um, shoes, just check at where the socks end if you have... Um, you know, they, if you go to check, uh, to look for avocado, then you press and it goes in if it's ripe. So you check if the same thing has happened to your, to your legs, if there's an indentation. Facial puffiness, and most of the time this facial puffiness is worse in the morning, just when you wake up. Then it might get better as the day progresses. So, again, men, I know you don't look at yourselves in the mirror. Take a mirror in the morning, just look and see, am I looking puffy or is this my normal uh, face? Generalized body swelling, now that is a later stage. Worsening or new onset hypertension. Now, for people who have hypertension, then develop um, chronic kidney disease, then they'll realize they need more medication to, ma to manage their hypertension. But for people who didn't have hypertension, then they have an, early, like an onset of hypertension. It is good to check that your kidneys are okay. So for everyone who's going uh, for a checkup and you get that you have high blood pressure, always ask your doctor, can I have a check of my kidneys? Just so that you, it is not because of uh, that, I mean, uh, because of ki uh, chronic kidney disease. Now, people with diabetes, they tend to feel like if uh, I was using three drugs for diabetes and now I'm using one or none at all, then something really good has happened. But in the setting of... Um, in the setting of chronic kidney disease, that is not a good sign. What it basically means is you're requiring less medication because your kidney function is getting worse. Let me explain that. Your body produces insulin. For insulin to work, it needs to remain in the, in the, um, in the bloodstream. 
Now a healthy kidney breaks down that insulin and you pee it out. A kidney that is not working well will not break that insulin and insulin will remain in, in your blood. If insulin remains in your blood for long, then your blood sugars will calm down. It doesn't mean that your, your body is getting better, the diabetes is getting better. It just means the kidneys are not doing their function. So if you are on medication or if you are on insulin injection and you realize that you are getting more symptoms of low blood sugar, it is good to check uh, kidney function to know if that is the reason. So then how do we prevent diabetes and hypertension as a way of preventing um, chronic kidney disease? Or plus preventing every other thing, stroke, um, uh, poor eyesight or amputations. So exercise. I tell people if you can exercise for 30 minutes only every day, that would be fantastic. But if you can't do it every day, try at least five times a week. And this is moderate uh, exercises. What does moderate mean? At least you're walking quickly to the point that if I'm walking with you, we won't be able to communicate as I'm talking. I'll be <sighs> as, we are, as we are talking. Um, swimming is a form of uh, moderate to high intensity exercise. Aerobics skipping the rope or jogging. Now, um, people tell me, Doctor, I don't even have time for myself, so when will I get time to go uh, uh, to the gym or whatever? Walking, you don't have to go to the gym. You can just use your compound. You walk quickly around your house many, many times. Um, this is just a picture showing the benefits of walking. If you, if you walk, uh, the immediate, um, the immediate uh, results of walking is you have better sleep, less anxiety, and a better blood pressure. Now, the long-term effects are you improve your brain health, your heart health, uh, cancer, because cancer does not, cancer likes high sugars. If you're going to walk more, you're going to lessen your sugars, blood sugars, and probably prevent your uh, chances of getting cancer. Uh, a healthy weight, bone strength, and balance and coordination. Remember, we will not always be this young. We will age, if God allows, and we will need our bones to be strong so that we do not have easy falls, and we will need our uh, muscles to be strong for us to to move around. Frailty is a sign that uh, you can easily fall and you can easily get a fracture. So it's the same thing. By three minutes, you're reducing your blood pressure. By five minutes, your mood improves. By 10 minutes, you start thinking what, um, creatively. By 15 minutes, your blood sugar decreases. Uh, 30 minutes help, helps to reduce weight, sorry. 40 minutes reduces the risk of developing heart disease. And by 90 minutes, you reduce the number of depressive thoughts. Now, as a way of um, trying what I preach, that was me. Uh, and that is still me on two different, um, uh, two different um, times trying to, if I can't walk and if I can't go to the gym, then I'll, I'll ride the bike. Diet. So what goes on your plate? Um, the lady mentioned that it is the activities, the day-to-day -day things that we do that predispose us to diseases. So what do we eat? I'm sure when we go for weddings, this has always happened to us. On one plate, they put chapati, they put rice, they put mokimo, they put um, pilau, and then... They, in fact, you say, achana na mboga, yon takula skunyingine. Then they put kuku, uh, stew, maharagwe maybe if you want, samaki, and then there's no space for fruits. Then you say, ah, nyeke watermelon bili apoju. So, 
I'm sure this is a common thing. That is what our plate should look like. Please do this. Put up a fist. Look at it. Look at your fist. That is how big your ugali piece should be. If you eat beyond that, umekula ya kesho. So, if you see that plate, plenty of vegetables, uh, proteins, then very minimal carbohydrates. I encourage avocado. Why? Because it has good cholesterol. It helps to minimize the bad cholesterol and promotes the, the good cholesterol. I use this diagram to explain to diabetic patients what then they should eat. There is a myth that if you are diabetic, you need to eat high carbohydrate. When I say carbohydrate, I mean your starches, your um, ugali, rice, ngwashe, etc., etc. Um, you need to eat more of that in small portions many times. That was what we used to tell people in the past. But using this diagram, this is how, this is your blood sugar level, and this is the time from the time you've eaten. If you eat, eat carbohydrates, your blood sugar goes very fast up, then comes down pretty fast. If you eat proteins, your blood sugar doesn't go so up, and it takes a bit of some time before it comes down. If you eat good fats, which are found in uh, groundnuts, peanuts, almonds, um, and avocados, your blood sugar rarely goes up, and it's sustained for a long time. So it just tells me that if you put a plate with a lot of carbohydrates, like that one. There's chapati there. There's, I think that is mokimo. Then there's probably pilau on the lower side. That is high on carbohydrates. Your sugars will go up very fast, but they'll also come down very fast. Then what will happen? You'll feel hungry again, and you want more food. And then you go again for a high carbohydrate meal. Again, it will go up very fast and come down very fast. In in at the end, you, what you just end up with is taking a lot of carbohydrates and you end up taking your sugars really up and sugars come down really fast. Now, allow me to explain something using this, this diagram. Whatever your body does not need at that time, whatever your body, the, the glucose that your body breaks down, if that energy, your body doesn't need it at that time, then it is converted into fat and it is stored around your organs. Now, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates and you are not exercising to use up that energy, then that energy is that glucose is converted to fat and you'll end up storing it. That just means the more carbohydrates that you're eating on frequent times without exercising, the more fat you're storing around your organs. Weight loss. So weight loss is good for both diabetes and hypertension. And here, this was a statistics that, uh, a study that was done that said for every uh, kilogram of weight that you lose, then you you're likely to reduce your blood pressure by one to two millimeters of mercury. That just means by the time you, uh, of course it won't, it, it's up to around 10, uh, uh, about 10 millimeters of uh, blood pressure change. That means if you lose 10 kgs, you're likely to reduce your blood pressure from a point of 130 to 120. But again, if you lose 10 kg, because it can be up to 2, you're likely to reduce your blood pressure from 140 to 120. So that means you get from one stage of hypertension to a better stage. This is more pronounced in people who are overweight and obese. Sleep, we talked about sleep, and we said adequate sleep is 7 to 9 hours of sleep. 
Um, poor sleep increases your chances of getting hypertension. It just means you didn't give your body enough time for it to, to rest enough for your, your stress levels to go down, for your body to regenerate, so you have high, higher risk of developing hypertension. And if someone is snoring, and it happens mostly to people who are a bit on the heavier side, then that increases chances of getting hypertension. So the others are quite, uh, um, I will say, obvious. Stop smoking. There's no benefit of smoking at all. Stop alcohol. Again, um, really no benefit, medical benefit of taking alcohol. And take your medication as prescribed. You remember we said out of the people who know that they are hypertensive, only about 6.5% take medication, and a smaller fraction of that are well controlled. So I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll just want to hear after this talk what you think. Is it a myth? Is it a fact? Eating too much sugar causes diabetes? It's a myth. Yes, it is a myth. Um, Eating too much sugar will just lead to weight gain and not really diabetes. It is the weight gain and, uh, I don't know, it's not, uh, which is a risk factor for diabetes. A myth or a fact, small frequent carbohydrate-rich meals is advised in patients with diabetes. Is it a myth? Is it a fact that they need small frequent carbohydrate meals pardon it is a myth we talked about this using this um using this so for every time they are taking a lot of carbohydrates and they are not using up that uh, glucose that they are taking in they end up storing it as uh, fat around their organs and that even worsens the diabetes. So that is um, that is a myth. Um, so carbohydrates, especially the refined ones, uh, cause spikes in blood sugars, and that's and that is not advised. I like this quote. It says, "I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better." My hope is with this knowledge, now that you know you, you, you can take less carbohydrates, now that you know you need to exercise, now that you know if you are smoking, you need to stop smoking, um, you need longer duration to sleep. I'm hoping with that information that we can all do better. Thank you. Any question? I just thank you for the presentation, Dr. I'm just wondering about fruits, because most, most people who are diabetic, they, they really don't go near fruits. And some of them say, we don't eat avocado, I can't eat this. What is your advice? Um, fruits, like any other thing that you eat, has to be in moderation, because fruits have sugar that tasty thing, we call it fructose. The body doesn't know that I got this glucose from a biscuit or I got this sugar from an orange. It, in the end, if that energy is not used up, it will end up as stored as fat. So if you're taking an orange, I advise people, cut it into, into four, take us a piece in the morning, move around, take another piece around 10, move, move around, take another piece if you want over lunchtime or over, over the 10, uh, p I mean the 4 p.m. Uh, tea, move around, take the other piece at dinner. I won't, I am an advocate for avocado. Of course, don't take it a lot because it then is, it has a lot of calories if you don't uh, exercise and use up that, those calories, you will end up storing it as fat. But avocados have very good proteins that, I mean, uh, fats that help 
reduce the bad cholesterol and improve the, the good cholesterol. So everything in moderation. I'm not, um, I know people say I'm eating healthy and they fill their plate with fruits and eat a fruit salad. You are just eating a lot of sugar and that will, will end up being stored as fat. If you want fruits are very good, but eat in moderation and in, in portions that allow you to exercise and you, ex you use up that energy, then take another portion and use that energy. In fact, um, the, the uh, recommended uh, portions of uh, fruits is up to four servings in a day, but in small, small portions, very small portions. Any other question? Uh, thank you, Doctor, for the good presentation. Mine is in regard to soya. I know there are times there have been uh, some debate about the pros and cons of soya. There are those who have said that soya is not good, so I don't know whether it is, or it's the way, it, the way it's prepared. I don't know what we can talk about that. So the debate around soya is something called phytoestrogens. They say that um, soya beans, um, so they have, uh, they help to form estrogens and those estrogens can cause some cancers. There is no really um, any study that has conclusively said that if you take more soya, then you have an increased risk of, say, breast cancer or, or uterine cancer. No. Um, I will say again, everything in moderation. Um, no study that has said people with breast cancer, when they take soya, that their cancer wasn't. I haven't seen any. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, there is no li such literature. Thanks a lot. Now, uh, you've spoken about fruits. Uh, my question will be uh, just a clarification. What is the best time to eat fruits? Secondly, is it better to juice it or to eat it whole? Um, we pre I advise people to take fruits before, and this is the reason. Fruits, most fruits have vitamin C. If you take foods rich in iron, after taking vitamin C, you increase your chances of absorbing vita uh, the iron. So if you're going to take any food that has iron, you take, um, say, an orange, it's high in vitamin C, take it before, so that it sort of prepares your, your body to absorb more. About juicing, um, I, I see uh, all manners of things on the internet and they talk about the benefits of juicing. If you're going to juice um, things like celery and spinach, very well. If you're going to add fruits in small portions, because if you see, you can imagine if you squeeze an orange, uh, how many oranges will you need to make a glass of juice? You'll need a lot, say maybe three. Taking three oranges at one sitting, you've taken a lot of sugar that will end up being stored as fat. If you're going to juice things like um, uh, add uh, the vegetables and uh, just a little, a handful of um, uh, fruits, just enough for that portion at that time, then very well. But if you're going to juice and drink just a lot of fruits, then you, you, you're just going to store up uh, that uh, glucose as, as fat. I guess there are no other questions. Oh. Uh, on the fruits, what about watermelon? 
Watermelon is a great fruit. 90% is water, only the other 10% is, um, has uh, nutritional sort of nutritional value. Be why I say it's great, then you can take it a little bit more. But to know how much you can take is then hard. Again, I'll go back to portions just in moderation. Because if you take a lot, because you're assuming that 90% of what you're taking is just water, you'll end up taking a lot. And if it's a sweet kind, the glucose content in it is high. So you'll end up storing, again, everything as fat. You, yes. This may not be related to hypertension and uh, diabetes, but what, what can you eat to reduce belly fat, belly fat? Because uh, sometimes you find it difficult, even if you do exercise and you want, belly fat doesn't go. Oh, I'm being told time is up, but I'll answer that. Um, I'll go back to this. You might have heard of keto diet. I'm not telling you to do keto diet. And again, if you have something like uh, chronic kidney disease, don't go on a keto diet until you're advised how safe that is. If you, uh, carbohydrates are what then drives your cholesterol more. Belly fat is basically fat under your skin and fat around your organs. If you do not eat lots of carbohydrates, you fast reduce your the foods that will convert into carbohydrates and I mean convert into fats and less will be stored around your your belly. That is one. Two, proteins. A portion of proteins is converted into glucose. All all foods that we eat end up being converted to glucose. Now, if you take more of the proteins, less of the carbohydrates, you'll have a calorie deficit. What will happen? Your body will then burn up that, that uh, fat that was stored around here to give you the extra energy that you need. By burning that fat, you're reducing your, your circumference. Yes. Yes. The gentleman who was telling me time is up, is not around. Guess we can. Oh, there's another program. So I'm, I'm begging that this becomes the last question. So apologies for asking too many questions. Now, I know it's advised to drink water, lots of water. Now, can we say that by drink, we need to just drink pure water, or can we say when we drink tea, we drink porridge, we drink, we are taking water? So uh, plain water, we tell people about two liters in a day because beyond that, you're diluting your, your salts and you'll start getting a headache, etc. Now, if you're taking um, porridge, porridge in it has water. Uh, if you've already reached your two liters limit, taking extra will just be diluting now your the sodium in your body, the, I mean, let me call it the salts in your body. So uh, if you're going to, to take plenty of tea and that tea you've put water in it, then you probably need to reduce on the, the fluids, that, the plain water that you're taking. Mm. Sorry, maybe a quick one. Now, um, most of the time we are advised not to mix fruits and vegetables in one sitting. So if you're taking a meal with fruits, it be that time. But then another time you do food with vegetables. But at times you, um, you find, like when you're doing the smoothies, because of that yakish t taste, you're told, you know, put a fruit to sweeten it all, and all that. Now, do you do the mixing? Does it harm or you can mix? Uh, leaves, the green leafy uh, vegetables have iron. The, the, the point of adding uh, fruits is not just for taste, but it also has a nutritional background. You are increasing your uh, vitamin C, so increasing your rate of absorption of the iron in the, in the vegetables, in the green leafy vegetables but don't do it extremely, like uh, put a big 
portion of um, fruits that will end up just being converted to glucose and being stored as fat. I am I am told the 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 young people yeah our young ones who are presenting something I will request that this is the last one then the question is about the mixture of fruits how many fruits do you mix at the same time for example if you want to juice can you make a cucumber carrot and beetroot is that too much no the mixture I think is the issue and an Okay, I'm told time is up. Can I answer that aside kindly? Allow me. Thank you very much.